Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We're just gonna give it another few seconds to let people in from the waiting room. And then we're gonna get started. Okay. Um, I think we'll get started now. Um, I'm Judy, I'm the Executive Director of FEAST. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, today's topic is compulsive exercise and the safe return to sports, um, which is a great topic. We have Sarah Archer with us today presenting. Um, and um, in terms of housekeeping, just a few little rules. Um, the first is um, to please keep your cameras and your microphones off during the entire webinar. And the second thing is if you have questions for Sarah during the course of the webinar, just put them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. We'll take as many questions as we have time for. Um, and I do have a request because I have to moderate the chats for the questions, um, is just to please make sure to only put things in the chat box that are questions addressed to Sarah um, and not kind of chatter between participants because otherwise it's really hard for me to find the questions at the end of the session. So um, I'm gonna let Sarah get started uh, and I will see you all for the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Judy, for having me. Um, I'm going to kind of just jump into my slides right away. Um, so I feel really honored to be able to speak to you all. Um, I really enjoy educating and empowering um, caregivers, parents, so that they can more effectively help their child recover. And I think that um, exercise and removement to sport can be a heated, controversial, emotional topic because I think it's such a fragile and vulnerable um, area to discuss. And I think it's um, extremely important to have those kind of discussions. So I'm excited to be here with you today and I will get going. Okay. Not letting me go forward. It happened the last time. Let me. All right. So, just quickly about me um, I'm the clinical director of Align um, Residential Treatment Center. We're an FBT um, treatment center, in that a lot of focus of our treatment is educating and empowering parents um, using an FBT model. But I will quickly go through that so that we can um, move forward. All right, so the biggest question, why are you guys here and why is this important for you to know? Um, so exercise, exercise is everywhere, even if it's something you kind of want to, you know, put to the side or not think about. And to be honest, I've been, um, I was at UCSD since about 2010. And it's something early on that we as clinicians didn't really have enough data on and really didn't talk about. Um, it's something that you kind of were like, eh, maybe we'll get to that at some point, or it's too much of a slippery slope. Let's not really talk about it. Um, but with all these kind of components, it's a conversation that needs to be had. So why do we need to talk about this? Well, disordered exercise post-treatment is actually the second highest predictor of relapse. So that's pretty sobering. Also, four out of five individuals with an eating disorder also struggle with disordered exercise. So DEX, you'll see a lot, disordered exercise. Youth sports, over 50% of um, children and youth do participate in some kind of rec sports. And you will see these in all different types of sports. Um, eating disorders, you often, you know, there's the stereotype, oh, gymnastics, ice skating, I see uh, lacrosse, soccer, rock climbing, swimming, wrestling, dance, cheerleading, um, football. You're going to see all different. So, um, and sports can be a big part of just adolescent teen culture. Movement is encouraged. Um, we do know that there is data that a sedentary lifestyle is not great, more of a predictor of health than um, weight. So your children are going to be encouraged by their primary care doctors um, to move and that we also know that it really helps manage depression and anxiety. So 
movement is a wonderful thing um, that's encouraged. PE, um, a lot of your children are in, you know, we can talk about some people have to have, be able to take a break from PE, but PE is mandated. Some kind of movement, unless there is a note, is mandated in school. Um, movement is a part of family culture, joyful movement. Um, often families love to hike together, bike together. Just because your child struggles with an eating disorder does not eliminate that as part of their lifestyle or a part of yours. Again, it's a very vulnerable thing, so we need to talk about it. Peer culture, what do a bunch of teens and adolescents do when they gather? They skateboard, they swim, they play catch, they, you know, bopping around town, whatever they're doing, it's a big part of um, culture. It's also really important for you to know because of um, red S, so relative energy deficiency syndrome, where by not taking in enough energy to be able to expend energy, when you go into that deficit, you have a host of problems, anything from, you know, gastrointestinal, immunological, it really impacts all aspects of the body and is very dangerous to get into. Um, it can lead to issues with bone health, um, and, and it really impacts um, recovery and your child's medical stability. Another reason why you need to know. And last, and I think something that is um, I see as a clinician, it can be a huge motivation for recovery, and it can also be a huge vulnerability. So kind of that dialect, dialectic there. All right, so let's get right into dysfunctional disordered exercise, DEX. So we're kind of look at it, um, as I mentioned, it does, compulsive exercise does affect up to four out of five individuals with eating disorders. Um, you may see it very clearly with your child. I've had cases where it's very secretive. Um, it can be done at right in front of you. It can be done within the context of their sport. The kid that likes to do extra laps, help the coach with extra activities. It can also be done with a child setting their alarm at three in the morning. So this can be right in plain sight or very secretive. So kind of how do we categorize disordered exercise, dysfunctional disordered exercise? We're looking at the quantity, um, how much, how often, when, um, the compulsive, the compulsivity and rigidity of this in terms of their schedule. Um, there's a level of franticness with dysfunctional exercise. Um, a lot of my, the parents I work with said, it looks like a chore, a job. The child does not look like they're enjoying this. It's um, a behavior that, um, really feeds the eating disorder if they don't do it, if they don't follow through with it. Um, it can lead obviously to not eating, dysregulation, um, oppositional behavior where you it's very different than joyful or competitive movement. Um, what is the motivation, the exercise motivation? Are you doing this to get better at your sport? Are you doing this because it's fun and joyful? Are you doing this because you're doing behavior activation and regulating depression, or are you simply doing this because you wanna give yourself permission to eat or forgive yourself for eating? So what again is the motivation that is helping you, um, that is pushing the motivation, pushing the drive to exercise? Incidental movement is a part of this kind of as well, this dysfunctional exercise um, components. And that really is looking at you know, movement that is not stereotypically associated with um, like exercise, but it could be, you know, doing laundry. <laughs> like if suddenly your child is like, I'll do the laundry, running up and down the stairs, going grocery shopping, bringing in all the groceries, um, pacing, um, standing at long periods of time. So you're, that's kind of another component of this. So I think for you all to know as caregivers and providers that dysfunctional exercise can be, again, right in plain sight. It can be very secretive. It can be connected to their sport. It can be connected to kind of common um, everyday lifestyle, just doing it in a way like I've had patients when they're walking, they're kind of doing like crunches, um, 
Whereas um, with joyful and, comp and competitive moment movement, it's going to look very, very different. But again, this is something we need to discuss because most of your children or patients will come in with this as a part of their presentation. And it is a huge component to um, relapse. So it's the, often the first presenting and the last remaining eating disorder symptom, but the topic that's very, you know, uncomfortable discussing. Um, if not addressed in treatment, it can be li linked to worsening symptoms, poor quality of life, longer treatment episodes, more of a chronic presentation and a greater risk of relapse. So hopefully I'm letting you know how important this is. Um, so this is an example of like the CET, a compulsive exercise test that really we can assess and utilize for addressing problematic exercise. There's also the obligatory exercise scale um, that we use to really look at what is driving the um, exercise and how much it is impacting um, a patient. So that's just an example of um, a measure that's used. So um, kind of what we're what we're doing and the within a residential level is we are since this has such an impact um, on a child's presentation and their recovery and their prognosis, we're really adding this now within the residential um, treatment model, which you could again argue is controversial. Like, why are you um, focusing on that? And I'll go a little bit more into like kind of how we um, prioritize that. But this is really an example of what we're talking about um, within the patient group, as well as what we're talking about in the parent group. Um, so a big part of treatment for dysfunctional exercise and return to sport is not only providing psychoeducation, um, processing, you know, kind of how this specifically impacts them and their sport, um, you know, using DBT skills and stress management, talking about nutrition, challenges, um, exercise monitoring, doing exposures. We talk about this with the patients, but this is also part of our parent curriculum. So I do think if your child is returning to sport, it is something in exercise. Um, it's something not only that they need to have um, treatment on, but you as the parent um, and caregivers do as well, because it will really set you up for success and to manage something that's extremely vulnerable. All right, so C's. Um, C's uh, is safe exercise at every stage. Um, so really the principles, what we follow is looking at the latest data based on C's guidelines. Um, a group of individuals, MDs, PhDs came together really looking at how do we put together guidelines and principles to so that clinicians can follow. Because at the end of the day, there really wasn't anything for clinicians to follow. So why would caregivers feel comfortable um, being told what to do? And really they kind of looked at it like a non-abstinence model. I will tell you, and I will go back to this, there will be a time period where we do not allow any exercise if your child is medically unstable. So when I say non-abstinence, I don't want you to think that that means whenever, however, it is a very structured, very methodical plan. But overall, the idea is let's not take away movement um, totally, because that's not going to help your child manage a symptom that is present and that can haunt them in recovery. Safety, 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 safety is a big part of these principles. I will talk about that more in detail for return to sport. Um, taking a holistic perspective to really understand your child's or patient's relationship with activity. Um, what is driving this? Um, is this joyful? Is this for mental health? Is this for friends? Is this family culture? Um, promoting intuitive and mindful movement um, to really focus on slowing things down. Um, as I said, um, 
compulsive compensatory dysfunctional exercise is a very frantic, non-mindful experience for your patients. It is driven by stress and we really are trying to slow down this process and kind of understand why we're doing movement and have a more mindful approach with it. Um, and again, I think the biggest thing we're really trying to focus on is collaboration um, among the treatment team, patient, and the family. Families are part of the treatment team, and you as caregivers will be a huge part in monitoring um, and your child's return to movement. Um, okay. How do I know, this is probably one of the biggest questions um, I get. Um, how do you know if it's eating disorder or joyful competitive um, movement? Um, so I think the first question is like, when did the sport or movement begin? If your child has always loved, um, and again, it might be one of those controversial sports that, you know, ballet. If your child has always loved a certain sport, it brings them joy. Um, I always tell my patients, like, what's something you do where you don't look at the clock, where time kind of stands still and you're fully present? And if, if, if that's an activity that they love, that's a good start. If your child started track a couple months into their eating disorder right up before, and when you watch them perform the sport, it is a grueling, stressful, rigid experience, that's probably good. Trust your gut. As parents, you guys know, if your child started an activity within the context only of their eating disorder, um, that's very telling. However, if they have done this for a long time and really find joy, that's another story. Um, are they willing to follow the protocol? And I will get into the protocol, but at the end of the day, are they willing to be supervised and refuel? Are they willing to only do it a couple days a week? Are they willing to have rest days? If the answer is absolutely not, that's probably more eating disorder driven. How is their behavior during and after, before, during, and after? Um, what is their, this is something that the clinicians do with um, the patients to really kind of self-monitor um, the authentic motivation, how they're feeling, are they joyful? Is it something that they're fully participating in? What happens after? Um, that's something as parents you can observe and that's something clinicians really work with them on. Is this the only way they will eat? I think that's a big one. It should be, it can be, excuse me, something that can be very helpful in using to motivate them to get through meals, to have the privilege of being able to do a sport and be able to do things. And if it's the only way they eat, um, that is a big sign that um, the eating disorder still has too much of a grip over this. Um, also, if this is their only coping skill, you're gonna get into a danger zone because within the sport world, within joyful movement, people get injured all the time, right? You might pull a hamstring, um, the weather might cancel a game, um, you might not be able to follow or stay in a sport, they might not make the team. So if the only reason your child is managing their recovery is because of their sport and exercise, that's gonna get you into trouble. So a big part of our treatment and safe exercise um, guidelines is really to have a more dynamic, um, rich set of hobbies to draw on um, so that, you know, whether it's volunteering, art, um, community work, whatever it is, exercise can be one of your child's coping skills. Maybe sport is their primary life worth living, can't be the only thing. And I think all of us know that Oftentimes, um, you know, when we go to college, when we're an adult, a young adult, we don't really have the time to do as much exercise as sports. So as they grow, you really need to have more things in their repertoire to be able to draw from. Okay, kind of going back to now going into return to sport and exercise. Is your child ready? So medical. So they have to be minimum 85% of their ideal body weight to do anything. Their ideal body weight based on growth charts that a dietitian and an MD set. Um, this is important for their medical stability, 
um, and for, you know, overall their medical safety. Um, this is when I said they will be benched. Um, I really like the idea of looking with a lot of athletes, especially look like their eating disorder is an injury and it's a serious injury. And if they are under a certain weight percentage or their vitals are off or their DEXA scan shows that, um, you know, their bone health is low, they're benched. It's like you tore your ACL, you broke your arm, you cannot move and your body is not well enough to do anything, which is really common experience for athletes when they have a serious debilitating injury. Um, so we really, um, that's a big thing. Safety always, um, eating disorder behaviors, um, is your child's, um, eating? Are they consistently eating? Are they purging? Um, are they refusing to stop compulsive moving? So this is something your treatment team will help you with. But again, purging and exercise varied and restricting very dangerous combination. So obviously, we're looking at are, are their eating disorder behaviors managed to a point where the medical dietary clinical and the parents feel the kid is ready to move from a medical perspective. The next thing that I think is sometimes like overlooked and not talked about enough is what's, the, is this really a priority? Like if your child is engaging in self-harm, if they are suicidal, if you're dealing with a lot of ineffective behavior, no, probably not. Like as clinicians, we're really looking at safety as a pyramid, like what's on top. Um, you know, could this be a potential safety issue? So, you know, is this a priority? Like I said before, the willingness to follow the plan. If they're like, nope, I want to exercise no matter what, but I'm unwilling to be supervised and I'm unwilling to refuel. So a big part of return to movement is the, the combination of your child is still not able to be left alone um, in the beginning of movement, that's something maybe you can work towards. Um, but I do think um, supervision is so important in helping your child, just like you would supervise them at a meal. This is a very vulnerable spot. Um, I'm. This is also another great protective factor of a team sport or an individual sport where there's coaches, rather than having your kid go to a gym or exercise at home. Um, Gyms are sometimes useful for activity that's focused on sport-related movement. Some sports teams use the gym to utilize equipment to help them have a better stroke, hit the ball further, throw the ball further. However, in terms of just allowing your child to go to the gym, I've had some families where that's a part of their family culture, and it is very... Um, structured beginning middle and end time it is a very supervised activity it's a very vulnerable spot you as parents can make that decision but i do think the supervision and the use of outdoor activity rather than inside a gym um, would be more effective um, and you are the parents so if you feel taking your child on a workout or doing something with them um, is helpful that is up to you and your treatment team can, you know, help you do that in the most effective way. Um, the refuel, this is something that your dietitian um, will work with you on. Um, refills, ref, sorry, refuels are used for a couple of reasons. They help with uh, muscle repair. They help with energy. Um, literally you're refueling the energy so that this does not lead to a caloric deficit. And it's also psychological for your child to understand that they are moving for joy, for sport, for fun, for peers, for family, not to burn um, energy. Um, how do you create a safe movement plan? Um, these are the people you want involved in it. Yourself, a coach, therapist, dietitian, MD. I know coach, probably a lot of you are like, ooh, I don't want the coach to know. I can't force you to. I can tell you that um, 
involving a coach is involving another set of eyes and kind of the the holder of the domain of the sport and that I can't tell you how many I've talked to coaches and they just said, oh, wow, I just thought this kid really was, you know, wanting to be an elite athlete or really just a hard worker. And really, you know, we're seeing a lot of that similarity between the temperamental traits of a good athlete with somebody with an eating disorder, tenacity, um, pushing through pain, denying discomfort, perfectionism. Coaches love these kids, right? They're the they're the kids on the team that are going the extra mile. Um, so a coach needs to really is a really essential part of the team, and that they need to understand that hey, they can do this amount of movement. Um, hey, they may need to bring. They need to do a mid fuel. I know sometimes you don't allow food in the studio. Yada yada yada. So having the the coach, the trainer, the director. Somebody in that sport needs to support you. Um, and the patients, a lot of the times, no way, no way. And we just say, hey, how important is returning to this um, activity? And um, oftentimes, um, it really isn't an issue. And I can tell you, most coaches at this point in their career have dealt with somebody um, with an eating disorder. Um, so this is kind of the phases of movement, just an introduction. Um, so you're really kind of going through different phases. You're, the beginning is medical behavioral stabilization. Then we're going through physical stabilization. That's like, you know, you're doing your flip-flop walks, we call them. Very, you know, yin yoga, which is mostly stressing, uh, sorry, um, stretching. And then you're kind of moving through strength, endurance, and performance. Um, again, these are done very methodical, supervised structure, and at any time can be stopped. At any time can be, hey, we need to spend more time in this area. Um, but as you see, it's a slow progression from no movement, very slow, doing a little bit of strength, then doing a little more endurance, getting to focused on performance and athletes and competition. And I have worked with patients through all these phases. Um, I do not do these movements with them. Um, we have a trainer that does this. Um, I do think um, I've had parents and um, other individuals support their child with this, but I do think it is important that you find somebody that um, understands obviously eating disorder um, and mindful movement. Um, this is an example of an exposure like of a baseball player um, focusing on mindful movement. Um, and you can kind of, I won't read this all to you, but you can kind of see that, that you're really looking at, um, you know, a process of your spending time on the authentic reasons they are moving, engaging in behaviors that are actually going to support their performance in sport. They refuel, they're acknowledging what's going on in their body, talking about any triggers, what emotions, and how it was to follow the protocol. So this is a very kind of step-by-step -step process. Okay, just gonna kind of keep going on. Um, so again, for athletes, even for, and again, you might ask yourself, is my child an athlete? Like, this doesn't mean your child has to be playing in college or an elite athlete. This could be somebody that really just enjoys um, rec sports or just personal activity. So a patient said to me once, my eating disorder is strong, but as an athlete, I feel stronger. And that really stuck with me for a long time because I think patients I've worked with, um, and, you know, you see a range of patients. Some patients are the, you know, get really dysregulated. Some are over-controlled, perfectionistic. I've seen a range of different temperamental traits along the spectrum of eating disorders. And I'm sure all of your children um, lay somewhere on that spectrum. Um, I can tell you, though, for the, the patient's universally say just how defeating and demoralizing 
the eating disorder makes them feel um, that, you know, they don't want to have these dysregulated outbursts. They don't want to choose restricting, purging, binging, avoidance of food um, over their family, their friends, their school, their sports, their hobbies. Um, and it's really kind of this um, defeating feeling. And for athletes, there seems to be this protective factor of, I really feel strong as an athlete. And I feel like in a way that gives me the empowerment I need to beat this extremely strong disorder that barks at me all day long. Um, it can be a big reason to recover. Like I said, can't be the only thing, but I know as parents, you're really desperate for your kid to find something to grasp on. And so this can be a really helpful thing. Um, the pros of returning to sport. Um, I love making these four square things with patients on the, the pros and cons of returning to sport and the pros and cons of not returning to sport. The pros 99% of the time way out if it's authentic to them, not something they started just in the context of the eating disorder. And I can tell you everything from leadership skills, um, building mastery, self-efficacy, um, competitive spirit, um, feeling special, feeling unique, family culture, social. Um, one of the big one that came up is keeping busy. A lot of your patients often struggle with anxiety as well. And, you know, kind of the, the, the lack of a skill structure and a routine. Um, I think we all saw what the, the impact of COVID when the world was canceled, right? And so the not having direction and a schedule can really impact um, a lot of these patients. So we get kind of a plethora. Um, I'll get into the vulnerabilities next, but, um, and I think you guys probably see, you know, where where in your child their sport movement is helpful. Athletes are great skills. So I love skills coaching athlete with DBT skills. Um, they can understand skills like learning a new soccer move or learning a volleyball technique. Hey, let's focus on, you know, um, a tip skill or let's, you know, focus on, um, alternate rebellion or radical acceptance or improve the moment or opposite action, just like you would learn a skill from a coach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's also this, you know, very similar temperamental traits. Um, people that are exceptional at school are exceptional at sport. You kind of have those similar traits you see in eating disorders. Um, like I said, the perfectionism kind of performance um, driven um, but they can also get in trouble for those same reasons, not taking care of themselves, not resting, um, focus too much on the outcome rather than the process, um, really struggling to um, enjoy what they're doing rather than focus on kind of how stressful it can be. All right, so what vulnerabilities will your kid face? And this is where I think the anxiety for parents comes in about their return to sport. It's gonna directly challenge and trigger the eating disorder. Um, it can be hard sometimes for patients to know when we do when, like, when is it eating disorder? When is it authentic? When is it joyful? We, you know, it, it, it's, it really kind of brings it right up to the surface um, in terms of the, um, having to only do a certain much, having a beginning, middle, and end, doing it one time a week, three times a week, five times a week, having a rest day, it really directly challenges the compulsive compensatory nature of the eating disorder. Um, messages from coaches and teammates about food and exercise. Um, I wish this was different, um, but I do think, unfortunately, I've just heard so many stories where, and I don't think it's you know, malintentioned coaches. I think coaches, especially if you think about middle school, high school, you know, they're not getting paid to be a coach. So this might be a second, third job for them. They're not spending hours researching the latest eating disorder treatment or, you know, why it's important for kids to have an all food fits model, why refuels. 
they're just not going to have that education. If you can find a coach like that, that's amazing. Um, but I've heard, you know, coaches will openly talk about weight, talk about different diets that the kids should go on. So find out, like, sometimes I've had parents really ask, like, what is your, what is your view on, you know, um, diversity in a meal plan? Do you talk to my child about what they should or should not eat? Um, again, uncomfortable conversations, but you really have to have uncomfortable conversations to set your kid up for success. Um, teammates, this is one that's a little harder to manage, which may require all the parents really, um, rallying around each other, be, but this is harder to manage just to be real. You know, I think sometimes you know, there's a lot of com competition among athletes naturally, but I think you put a bunch of adolescents and teens together talking about what they ate, what they didn't eat, if that was a good workout, if it wasn't. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. And this is something, you know, clinicians talk about. Uniform vulnerabilities, this could range to anything from, you know, I have cheer often have random cutouts that aren't really necessary for their sport. Um, you can see even in like beach volleyball, the significant difference in what men and women have to wear. But even like softball outfits, like in the pitcher, um, I've had a lot of patients say they have high sensitivity to fabric or where the uniforms sit, they're grabbing at them. Um, because uniforms aren't made, you know, individually, it's small, medium, large. Um, I had a patient say like every year seeing their body grow and having to go up in size and that, you know, one that kind of classic uniform was very uncomfortable. So uniform vulnerabilities is a big one, how they feel running or moving within certain material or how their body looks when they move in their uniform. Um, there's a lot of myths about size and performance. Um, a lot of patients will say the smaller you are, the faster you are, the more this, the more that. So, you know, that's something that for sure um, we challenge as clinicians. Um, but I think within the sport world, there's a lot of discussion about body shape and size and performance. I heard my patient said to me once, I want to play like Serena and look like Kendall. And I always found that very kind of telling. I think a lot of um, female athletes don't want to look like athletes. Um, and a lot of female athletes that go on to play in college where strength training is more pronounced have a really hard time with the changes in their body that are more strength-based. Um, another thing that pops up is comparing to past performance or others. A lot of your kids compare in general or can be competitive. So this comes up a lot where they are having a hard time being focused on where they're currently at rather than where they were right before treatment. Um, we already talked about the refuel and meal plan. Another thing that's interesting, I've had a lot of patients say, well, so if I do this, if I really commit to returning to sport, you're pretty much telling me I am reducing ambivalence, like I'm choosing recovery. It's like, yeah. <laughs> and that can be because we're not going to let them do it unless they are demonstrating pro recovery behaviors by being compliant, not engaging in behaviors and refueling. So that can be both a overwhelming and also a protective factor. Um, I think the last thing for this slide, social media messages, you guys all know how difficult um, social media is. But I do think too, just to put it out there, not all kids can return to sport. It can be too stressful. Um, I've had patients go back to sport, do great. I've had some patients say the pressure I feel, the anxiety and the perfectionism is way too strong. Can't do it. I've had others switch sports. I've had some go into totally different things. So anxiety and perfectionism Again, those are things that can make children successful at a lot of different things. And it's something that can burn them out, make them at risk for relapse and really impact their um, quality of life. Because if everything's focused on being the best and being perfect, it really takes out joy. Um, and that's something that you can work on to have a more balanced view. Okay, how does your family system talk about exercise? 
As caregivers, I think this is really important for you all to know. I've had a lot of parents say, can I never work out again? Can I, um, my, my other the sibling plays sport? How does this work? Um, so how do you talk about movement? I think you guys also just have to be very mindful about how you present movement. I think that, you know, there is a big difference in I'm going to go for a run because I ate too much for dinner or, oh, I hate this spin class, but I got to go because I'm getting older or something like your kids will hear that. Um, and again, lots of people in our culture and our society talk very openly and aggressively about why they exercise, what they eat, what they don't eat, how much they exercise, how much they don't exercise, if they're feeling lazy. A um, lot of people talk like that and don't have kids with eating disorders. That doesn't cause it. Obviously, we know that. And you guys having a child with an eating disorder, having a patient with an eating disorder, you have to be just more mindful of how you talk about exercise. So instead of, uh, oh, you know, just ate a lot today or just feeling crappy about myself and need to go work out, say, oh, I can't wait to hear this podcast and be outside in nature. Oh, I love hearing the songs in this class. I love being with my friends. So I think for you guys to really model, you know, or you may say you may be an, an adult that's in a, a league and say, oh, I love being competitive and having fun going to play, you know, a pickup soccer game or going to my yoga class because, wow, it really helps me regulate my stress and helps me be in the present moment. So just being really mindful. Um, another thing to think about is like, how does your child see themselves um, as an athlete? I've had a lot of patients say, this is my only identity. This is, you know, how my parents see me. This is how the community sees me. Um, what would happen if they quit? What if we really decide being an athlete is not going to support their recovery because it's too much? Um, how does that impact their role in the family system? How is How have you guys accommodated? This is, I am a mother. I have an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, just turned nine, nine and seven-year-old. She plays club lacrosse. This is an expensive, time-consuming thing. Um, and how is what what will come up for you when you have to put up boundaries what kind of accommodations have you guys like managed all your vacations around sporting events like how will this impact you I've had a lot of parents say I'm all my friends from the sport league or we've really adjusted our family life to accommodate movement and sport maybe you're not ready to make the changes um I worked with a patient that was probably on her way to Olympic elite level and it got too much and she had to pivot. And we had to do a lot of almost grief work with the parents because they spent a huge chunk of their lives supporting her journey. Um, and that was really difficult for them. One more, one or two more slides. Um, okay. How do you prevent exercise from being your kid's only coping skill? The movement plan, you know, it's going to start off, you know, three times, twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, really at max, you're wanting five every now and then. If you get a kid that has one of those sports, it's five to six. You have to have at least one, one to two rest days structured by the minute timed out um, so that it's not free movement, um, enhancing hobbies really putting your kids into activities, sometimes pushing them into the pool, so to speak, um, because they need to expand their identity. Um, for whatever, I think all the, all, I'll use that word, all of the patients I have ever worked with are really sensitive, caring individuals that are much better at taking care of other people than themselves. So volunteer, getting out of their head, getting out of their eating disorder and giving service to others. Um, that's something that's really motivated a lot of patients I work with and giving them more of um, a expansive identity. Um, setbacks and solutions. That's similar to how you guys do FBT with weight gain and weight loss if there's loss maybe there you restrict the movement you might increase the calories you're going to problem solve this just like you would with any other issue that would come up 
You might need to take it away. This needs to be directly in a contract um, where there is no guessing or having to come up with solutions on the spot. This is, this happened, so we do this. Um, you know, if they're refusing to refuel or be supervised, you're going to have to pause movement. That means they're not ready to do it. Um, you're going to have to figure out what is the function, what's getting in the way. You might have to get a coach involvement. You might, again, you're kind of going back to the drawing board to figure out. And then I think I got through everything. Questions, thoughts? Uh, one sec. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. That was a lot of information. Yeah. And a real <laughs> time. <laughs> I know I could um, talk about it. I could talk about it for, I tried to make sure I had room for questions. No, I, I appreciate that. And you covered a tremendous amount of ground. Um, so I'm going to start with a question of um, a lot of what you said um, was applicable to um, adolescents, you know, who are supervised by their parents. Um, what about adults who don't live at home? How would you modify some of what you spoke about for adults? I think, I think their treatment team um I think incorporating a dietitian um, and making sure their clinician and a dietitian are really working together to help for some accountability, whether it's logging, using tools to log movement, logging refuels. Um, I think you're going to have to rely more heavily on the treatment team. I also think if you have a young adult or an adult that's doing this um, and you have the resources, let's be real whether it's involving a trainer that really understands mindful movement or a coach or doing activity with a group of people for extra accountability. I do think when you are alone doing sport or any joyful or exercise, that eating disorder can really, um, you know, come in and take over and really challenge um, the wise mind of the ind individual. So I would say exercising with other people and really relying on your treatment team to set them up for success. And also, you know, having um, young adults and adults, you know, if as a parent, you can't supervise them, you can utilize contracts in the treatment team to support you. I've had have some patients that are in college and we have a very kind of strict structured contract to manage it. Um, so I see a few questions about the contracts. Um, can you give examples of things that would be in a contract? Um, yeah. How to create a contract? I, I think that it's, it's a little fuzzy. Got it. Okay. So contracts in general, we utilize them um, when our patients discharge our program and I've used them at PHP, IOP outpatient. So this can be used at all levels of care where you're really creating a structured set of rules, rewards, and consequences for your child to follow. And it can range from you must eat three meals and three snacks, um, not engage in certain behaviors. This is what will happen if you do. This is what will happen if you don't. And you can plug in movement. Like you, you will exercise following the treatment team's recommendation, which is currently blank, 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 and blank. You will refuel all movement. If you refuse to refuel or you exercise more than recommending, then blank, 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 blank. So you're really kind of laying out the groundwork and the expectations and what will happen if they don't. And I always like to add in contracts, um, you know, and we know this is very hard for you because you struggle with an eating disorder. So you will be rewarded in some way by following this protocol. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. You referenced DBT. And one of the questions is what sort of therapy can help? Um, our kid can't imagine a day without exercise, even though he hates the compulsion. Um, so can you talk a little bit to um, treatment for compulsive exercise? You talked a little bit about intervention um, like what parents can do, but what, what is some treatment that may work? Yeah. I mean, this is tricky because it's, if you have, um, 
I mean, end of the day, in the beginning, the treatment is you need a time. Well, first, you need a time period of not moving at all so that we can assess if they're if they're medically stable to exercise. Um, so that might mean containment or supervision. Um, that's kind of part of the treatment is we really need to assess should your child be moving at all? Are they above 85 percent? Are they how is their bone health? How is their vitals? There is potentially going to be a time period where there is no movement. That can be a very hard time for both patients and caregivers because literally patients feel like they're crawling out of their skin. Um, that's sometimes when we might refer to psychiatry, refer to a higher level of care. Like if this is something you feel you have no handle over, um, the parts of treatment really are, we're gonna be teaching them very similar um, distress tolerance skills, tip skills, which are really helping them. Because really, if you think about compulsive compensatory movement is a desperate attempt to regulate discomfort. So we're really pumping a bunch of distress tolerance, emotion reg skills at them to be able to tolerate that urge, that discomfort to be able to move their body. So part of the treatment is assessment. What are they allowed to do? psychoeducation about, you know, how it impacts their recovery, learning distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and then exposures, um, having them do movement that is time oriented, more mindful, um, you know, very scheduled, but oftentimes in the beginning, the supervision and the containment, so they are not allowed to do it is um, vital. And that is kind of, and I've had a lot of parents say like, it's impossible. It might mean them sleeping in your room. It might mean putting a mattress on the floor, literally. It might be, think of it, it's like the same as, you know, it is, it's purging, right? Through exercise, but it's the same way that you would have to monitor that. Like they cannot be in their room alone. Um, they will set an alarm clock. Um, they, they need to be contained and supervised. And sometimes it's very hard. So I have a lot of empathy for parents that are trying to do this at home because it can feel maddening. Hope that answered. If I if, if somebody needs more support, I can talk about that offline. Uh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. That was a really good answer. Um, okay, so um, I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, this was about, you know, people with eating disorders. Um, many of us here are parents. Um, and many of us here are parents who exercise. Mm -hmm. And when you have a kid with an eating disorder, it's always a question for parents of, do I keep to my normal exercise schedule? Um, you know, how does my child's eating disorder affect me in terms of what I can and can't do? So yep. can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I think that eating disorders impact parents so much that your mental stability and sanity is essential to do the ridiculous work that we're asking you to do. Um, so I'm going to answer this in kind of two parts. I think you as parents have to take care of yourself. You, you have to. Um, this is exhausting, relentless, unfair debilitating. And if exercise is how you cope with stress, you're going to need to do it. Might you need to be a little smart <laughs> and about when and how you do it? Um, your parent, your, 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 your children will know if you're wearing yoga pants all day and exercise gear, your kiddos will, will hear you if you talk about exercise in a um, negative, punishing, I ate too much way. How you talk about it's important. Being, being a little strategic when you do it, you may want to do it not in front of the TV while they're in the room trying, right? Kind of have to use some common sense a little bit about when you do it. But I do think um, if that is a part of your self-care and what you need to do to help manage the demanding things you have to regulate your child's eating disorder, do it. I also encourage you to expand your repertoire too of coping skills and model that for your child because um, I think it can be really helpful 
for your children to see that you also have a diverse set of coping skills and that you don't just solely rely on exercise. But if exercise works for you, I'm not going to tell you to get rid of it. Um, but I do think um, you may want to expand on it. And it's something I've had a I had a, a mom once she really loved um, kind of that hit workout, hit intense workouts, just how it was a tip skill for her in a way. It's how she regulated stress. So she did it, but she definitely did it and made it not as aware for the child. And then her and her child actually learned how to play the ukulele together as another really fun coping skill. And she found that doing something with her hands really was another way she could regulate stress and enjoy time with her kid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you encourage FBT therapists to be trained under the C's model? Yeah. I think they should know about it. Um, I think they should understand. Again, I, I, I know this can be a controversial um, topic, um, but given the fact that dysfunctional exercise impacts so many patients and can impact recovery, yes. Okay. Um, and let me just check if I didn't cover anything. Um, I mean, someone had asked, um, how does she explain to her daughter, her daughter's long distance runner who naturally has a low heart rate, um, because of, you know, the, the shape that she's in, um, and her daughter is having a hard time believing that it's the eating disorder that's lowering the heart rate and not her natural, you know, state of being an athlete. Um, how would you explain to a person, um, with an eating disorder that, you know, the exercise is dangerous and is compromising their heart? Yeah. Um, it's funny you say that because we've even had some providers and even physicians and coaches, you know, say similar things like, oh, it's just because they're an athlete or they didn't get their period. It's just because they're an athlete. Um, and a lot of that and it's maddening because it's a lot of very educated people that maybe don't specialize eating disorder. Um, even though it's like such a big part of our world for a lot of physicians and coaches and individuals, it's just not a part of their world. So people talk about like wrong information all the time. Um, I do think you could say she, so she may even be hearing that from professionals. I do think you could challenge her in that the heart rate is one indicator. There's a whole battery like, the relative, if you look up like relative energy deficiency syndrome, you're going to see all different estradiol levels, bone health. Um, you know, she can go there. There, That's one aspect. And, you know, she may want to talk to an eating disorder informed physician that can really challenge the messaging that, you know, you can be a very um, successful elite athlete. And you should be getting your period and have an appropriate heart rate, have stable vitals and be in a healthy um, weight range. Um, there's a really, um, there's a video on, if you go on YouTube, it's, um, oh God, she was a runner. Um, it's a Nike video about this female, young um, adult female runner who um, the coaches at Nike, um, I think his name was Albert Salazar or something, um, they really pushed her to keep losing weight and you, don't get your period, it doesn't matter, your heart rate. Um, if I can find that video, I'll try to find it. It's um, Mary something Nike runner, but it really ended up destroying her career and her body because she kept getting stress fractures, her... Um, all the symptoms that she would have of um, over exercise syndrome where she couldn't then perform. So you could even argue to your kiddo that having um, a strong heart rate, strong vitals, strong bones will actually make you perform better. And that's a question I ask a lot to the patients like, hey, you may be on the cusp, but like, can you imagine how good you would be as an athlete? Like if you care about how good of a runner you are, how good of a soccer player, you will get your body to the best performance where it needs to be. Um, thank you. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. 
Um, I would just like to ask the people who are here, um, if you enjoyed this webinar and you like programming like this, the only way that we can continue offering it for free is through the donations and generosity of our own community. So if you have a minute and um, you're good to donate, whatever you can donate would be really appreciated. You can just go on our website and do so. Um, and I just want to um, say that I hope you all can join us for our next webinar. It is going to be on July 10th. Um, the title is How We Developed FBT and Why It Works. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting um, because historically, you know, parents were really blamed for their kids' eating disorders. They were certainly not empowered uh, to be part of the treatment team. And Dr. LaGrange was one of the pioneers of bringing families into treatment. And I think what he has to say is going to be really interesting. So if you can make it on July 10th, uh, it's at noon Eastern time. Again, thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you, Sarah, for an amazing webinar. This will be online by tomorrow. Um, so if you want to share it with other people, you definitely can. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.